報警啊嘛。係啊 ，sir。When I made this video, I realized most people in the West don't really know much about Stephen Chow. So I want to dedicate this episode to one of Chow's career-defining aspects: the jokes. Making people laugh is difficult. There are people whose entire career is about making people laugh, and still they don't always land their jokes. Because at the time, he was a genius. If you have that interest, let's learn from the best. Let's learn how to tell a joke from Stephen Chow. Just to be clear, most of these jokes aren't written by Chow. But I use his films as an example for a reason. Stephen Chow's film defines Hong Kong humor. His brand of humor is called Mo Lei Tao, a word that can be loosely translated to nonsense. Emerged in the 70s, it's a form of humor where the punchline doesn't follow the logic of the setup. In other words, non sequiturs. The simplest example would be the use of modern day language or culture in a period piece. The joke does not follow the logic of the story, and the sudden shift in perspective makes you want to giggle. This echoes the incongruity theory of humor, which says that humor lies within the moment when audience realize the incongruity of the expected outcome and the actual outcome. We'll put a pin on these words right here. Let's come back to that later. Anyway, if you find that hard to follow, let's explain it with an example. Pavlov walks into a bar. The bell rings, and he says, "Oh sh! I forgot to feed my dogs." You see, Pavlov was the famous psychologist who rang his bell every time he fed his dogs. Eventually, the dogs began salivating just by hearing the sound of the bell. So when I said Pavlov walks into a bar, the expected logic is that it's a story about dogs conditioned to salivate. Then the punchline switches the logic around by telling us that Pavlov had conditioned himself to feed the dogs upon hearing the sound of the bell. When audience realize this incongruous juxtaposition of logic, they laugh. In Stephen Chow's nonsense jokes, the hidden logic is stretched much further. Take this joke from Flirting Scholar, for example. Mrs. Hua and the Killer Scholar is fighting, with impressive choreography, I may add. They roll under the table and then come out. With their clothes swapped, the intense fighting sets up a expected logic of a fight scene, only that the punchline that follows cartoon logic. And did you notice this part? This shot. What does it look like? These parts in the graphs are the precise moment when the logic of the joke is swapped, and is where the real humor lies. You find the humor when you realize what this part means. So, what makes Stephen Chow's nonsense different? Well, it's different in two ways. Firstly, in a regular joke, the punchline offers a new perspective to the same logic. Pavlov conditioned the dogs, and Pavlov conditioned himself are both valid logic that can coexist. In a Molaytau joke, however. The surface level logic is discarded in the span of one shot. Hence, it's a non sequitur joke. Secondly, the logic in Molaytau humor is on a meta level. Both lines of logic in the Pavlov jokes exist and make sense within the universe of the story. The two lines of logic from Flirting Scholar, however, is about the cinematic language. We know what action films do in scenes like this one. We come to expect a certain vocabulary, but when the film pulls the rug, it's not just that it doesn't make sense within the story; it switches genre entirely, breaking the fourth wall. So, if you want to tell a Stephen Chow's nonsense joke, 
set up a situation that operates on one logic. Then gives a punchline, then operates on another logic. For those of you who already knew who Pavlov is, the joke should be pretty funny. And it's okay for me to say that because I didn't come up with it. But for those of you who don't know about Pavlov, I suspect the joke remains unfunny even after I explain the joke. You don't get the joke? It's not funny even with explanation. But how about this? Even if you don't understand the reference, which is a parody of the body wash commercial of 1990s Hong Kong, the sheer absurdity of the image is enough to get a laugh. By pushing the logic of a joke to the form of the medium, you free up space to have a second overlapping joke. Now, your joke has layers. Here's another example. Chow makes fun of the story. The priest beats him over the head with a Bible. Chow punches back. Logic swaps. When I was a kid, knowing nothing about Christianity, I already thought it was a very funny joke. The mundane presentation of school life juxtaposed by, well, this, and the music. It's hilarious. But if you know about Christianity, there is another layer of logic hidden within the context of the plot. The priest was teaching the chapter leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. Child jokes about Jesus with disrespect. It makes sense that the punishment for child is to suffer like Jesus. The genre logic may have changed for the joke. The story logic remains connected. It's a multi-layer joke, and you only need to understand one layer to get a laugh. <laughs> Finally, let's consider which part of the joke we are laughing at, or where does the humor lies. Obviously, not the setup, but are we laughing at the punchline? While well, usually the most visually interesting part of the joke, are you laughing at two people cross-dressing? Or are you laughing at the notion that two people can fight so hard they swap outfit in the process? If you think the latter is the funnier part, that raises an interesting question. Why didn't they show the process? Why is the process of Chow being chained to a cross happen off-screen? Because that would spoil the punchline, right? Let's bring back our pin dissection from the incongruity theory. Humor arises not from any particular moment of the joke, but the moment you figure out a joke. You realize what happened under the table. You realize what Shaolin Kung Fu is in this movie. You realize the reason he's chained to a cross. You caught up and you laugh. And on good snappy jokes, you laugh after the joke is done. <laughs> this brings us to the final lesson of the day. Timing. This is a bit of a general advice, not exclusive to nonsense jokes. But in Stephen Chow films, jokes are often arranged in very careful ways. Take this joke from Love on Delivery, for example. Here, two fighters are too afraid to make any move. 
With no action, the TV executive forces the two commentators to make things up. So one guy begins reading off a martial art novel. This is the setup. In the heat of the moment, he loses the book by accident. So he has to read the other book. Okay, it's not actually Fifty Shades. I fudged the subtitle so you can experience the joke better. Think of it structurally, and you realize this is pretty much the same joke as the cross dressing joke. A setup that follows a dramatic, serious tone. A logic swap, where the detail is hidden from the audience. After the swap, audience realizes something is wrong. Clothing is swapped, passages are sexual, and finally, the realization from the audience. The jokes are constructed like a little puzzle. The goal is to figure out what happened during the logic swap. As soon as you swallow the answer, the audience is ahead of the joke, and the joke is over. Timing is such a difficult thing to keep in mind, even very minor missteps can be very obvious. Take bursting into songs and dance for example, it's a common joke in Moleta comedy. In this joke from Chow's recent film, The Mermaid, these two characters are bonding through songs. You can see the romantic singing moment is swapped to. Um, I'm not sure what this is supposed to be, but the logic swap is over, right here. Implication being that the man is warming up to this girl. But the film continues to finish the entire song, long after the audience figure out what caused the sudden shift. We are left to watch two idiots doing this cringy routine. Compared to this scene from Fight Back to School 2, You can see, similarly, the logic goes from school life to musical. It lasts just long enough for you to realize these two are flirting, and the joke ends. So if you want your audience to laugh instead of cringe, keep in mind when will your audience solve the little puzzle. As soon as they do, Move on with your film. Of course, this is not the only way to tell a joke. So take this not as a manual, but as an inspiration. Remember to twist or swap the underlying logic. Add another layer of subtext if you can. Keep it short and snappy. Don't explain the joke. And if you feel a bit overwhelmed, don't be afraid. Because not even the master himself is without mistakes. Damn it, so close. 